Wow. Okay, so this is Easter. And uh, there is nothing subtle about Easter. That's, that's the strange thing about it. Um, Christmas kind of creeps up with a manger and, uh, you know, the shepherds on the hillside and, and those kind of things. Easter, uh, the Bible says, starts out with an earthquake, uh, which is so not subtle. It is so um, not just a positive, uh, sweet, Eastery sort of thing. And, uh, and I've always been uh, kind of unsure. How, how do you preach on Easter? Because um, it's kind of a strange, um, strange thing, isn't it? That we, we all gather here and, um, and God is shaking up our world, shaking up our, um, our understanding of reality, shaking up our understanding of, of life and death. <laughs> and all of this gets changed and we, and we dress up and come in here and sometimes because, you know, uh, mom and dad have kind of dragged us here so that they can take us to lunch or something after. And whatever the reason, uh, the motivation, we're all here and, and, uh, and we think this is a very unique opportunity for God to speak into our life and to um, deal with us in the areas that we need to um, be dealt with. And so um, I think that um, the resurrection is God's way of getting our attention, of getting us to focus for a minute. And, um, and it's his way to um, not be vague and not be um, clever or cute or ambiguous or anything like that, but just shake up our world so that he can reform it a little bit. And uh, what we do with that is, uh, is really uh, amazing. Um, it was funny, I, I came today, and this is, I don't think this ever happens, but I came today and, and um, stopped off at um, Krispy Kreme, which I know that never happens, and uh, got, some, got some Easter donuts for you. And, uh, and then I came and I was sitting in the car, I turned off the engine and I started crying, which is very strange, right? And I'm just sitting there crying. And, and I realized, oh, I miss my mom. You know, she, we buried her on Good Friday a few years ago. And suddenly I realized, you know, she used to fly or drive to wherever uh, we were at Easter time and, and come to worship. And, and I, I suddenly missed her and started crying. And I thought, um, how weird is that? And then I came in and saw one of you who lost a daughter this year, and you were crying. And I thought, this is a very strange day. It's not that kind of easy, gentle, um, <coughs> uh, Easter bunny kind of thing, you know, with all the kind of pink and powder bluey stuff that, that, uh, that we kind of wish it is. And, uh, and it actually is very strong because Easter is where we confront uh, the, the big issue, uh, death and life, and is death the end or does God have a victory over it, and, and what does that mean to us? And uh, Peter Gomes uh, at Harvard University wrote this, when we come right down to it, the only point to the Christian gospel, the only authentic and real message that it has to communicate to us concerns not so much how to live the good life or how to deal with the bad life as it concerns a new attitude towards death. For in Christ, we see that death is not the end, that death itself is conquered, and that we can share in that promise of newness of life through Christ who conquered death for us. Therefore, rather than avoid death, the Christian confronts it, accepts it, realizes that death is a comma rather than a period. Get that? It's a comma rather than a period. That's the revolutionary attitude towards death, and it's the essential ingredient of the Christian message. Christ, through his resurrection of the dead, has overcome the ultimate enemy. That's really significant. And, and I think about it, I go, so how do people realize that are confronted with the resurrection of Christ, and 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 how do you respond to that? Um, in our passages that were read today in, in John 20, 
which is, uh, if you go back and look at it this week, it's such a, um, a, a human story. It's, it's all about people, isn't it? It's all about pe people and how they react and respond to the risen Christ. And you've got, uh, you've got Mary, you know, who's, who's grieving and is grieving so much that she doesn't even uh, recognize the risen Jesus, right? And, and thinks it's the gardener. Um, uh, why the gardener? I, I don't know. Um, but obviously dazed and confused, and she misses uh, Jesus standing right in front of her. And, and, then, and then she's told, you go and tell the disciples. And also tell Peter, of course, because um, Peter was the great betrayer. Uh, he didn't get as much fame in that as Judas, but you know, he was, he was up there. And uh, he was the betrayer, so they didn't really count him as one of the disciples. Go tell the disciples, and then go tell Peter, too. Uh, a little different. And then, and then so Peter comes running and uh, uh, bursts into the empty tomb, looks around, doesn't know what to do, and walks off. And we find out later he goes back to work, and just goes back fishing. You know, it's all over. And then you have young, young John, who's probably a teenager, uh, who wrote this gospel, and he comes running, and he's too afraid to go in. So he runs, gets there first, and then he stands around. <laughs> what do we do, you know? And then he goes in, finally, uh, and when Peter leaves, he goes in and, and looks, and then it says, and he does believe right, right there, seeing the evidence of the empty tomb, and he, he believes. Uh, and you go, boy, those are a couple of different kinds of um, reactions. And then you've got this group of disciples, it says, who are locked away with the doors locked, hiding, because they're afraid, well, whatever happened to Jesus is going to happen to them. What chance do they have? And so they're all hunkered down, uh, trying to not be seen. And Jesus uh, comes into their presence, and it's interesting, you know, he, he greets them with peace. Be, don't be anxious. Don't be afraid. Don't be uh, anxiety ridden. Uh, you can have peace. It's all right. I'm here. And they look at his hands and his scars and everything and they marvel. And, and he um, sends them out. So don't, don't hunker down in here. They, they send them out. And so they go out and they find Thomas, who had been one of the disciples. And Thomas, you know, has, has always gotten the bad rap. What, what was he called? Anybody go to Sunday school? Doubting. doubting Thomas. Oh yeah. Why did they make that his first name? You know, <laughs> doubting Thomas. You know, and uh, I got that all the time in Sunday school, and, and I, I thought, yeah, boy, he didn't have the kind of faith that I have. You know, or, you know. And uh, and and by the way, every time he's mentioned almost in the Bible, it says uh, Thomas called Didymus. Okay, that wasn't doubting. That's not Didymus doesn't mean doubting. It, it actually means twin. He was a somebody's twin, but they never mentioned who the other twin was. And I didn't know until I looked in the mirror yesterday, and I realized I was probably his twin. Um, but <laughs> the thing about Thomas is intriguing, and I want us to look at this today because, uh, for one, I, I don't think I've, I've ever preached about Thomas before in my life because I always dismissed him as the doubter. You know, who needs that? And then I realized, oh my goodness, he is so much like me. Uh, I could probably learn a, uh, something here. And it wasn't so much that he was the doubter. Uh, he was the one who said stuff that nobody else would say, but they were probably thinking. You know that? And so he was the one who, who um, kind of observed stuff and then made sarcastic comments. And Jesus kind of went, oh yeah, yeah, sure, keep coming, you know. And it was never, Jesus never seemed to be disturbed by him. But he's mentioned a couple of times in the Gospel of John, and, and I, I want to share that with you. The, the first one was when uh, Jesus is about to make this progression into Bethany. Uh, Lazarus had died, and he said, I'm going to go there. And Thomas speaks up and said, okay, let's all go, and we'll all die with him. <laughs> That's it. He's being sarcastic, you know. And... Uh, and so, uh, just kind of caustic and biting. Still went, you know, went with them. Sure, I'm going, I'm going. But, you know, this is a suicide mission. This is not going to end well. This is not 
the way to do this. Let's not go and this is not the time, you know, and it, it was obvious to everyone, but he's the one who says it. All right, let's go with Jesus and we'll all die with him. And then we hear from him again. And this is when, uh, in John 14, let me see if I can find it here. Um, Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Again, remember the peace, don't be anxious, don't be anxious. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. All right? You all heard that, right? Verse 5, next verse. Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Get real. Just, you know, and, and here we're having this very sacred moment where, you know, they're in their red letter Bible, you know, that's their Jesus words, and they're, they're all really nice, and they're, they're really comforting, and, 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 you know, you all heard, you know, my father's house in many rooms, and, you know, if we weren't so on, I'm going there. And then Thomas comes and interrupts it sarcastically. We don't know. we just following you to die anyway. It's like you. And now we don't know where we're going, and uh, how are we going to know the way? And Jesus doesn't even flinch. See, that's where you go, smack. You know, if it was my mother, you know, whack. <laughs> if it was my grandmother, it'd be a spoon on the ear. Bam. Whoa. Still ringing to this day, you know. And uh, I sit down at the table, and every time I say something kind of rude, I duck and hold my ear. It's just, I'm sorry, it's just, it's just the way it is. <laughs> In fact, when I preach, I do this a lot. <laughs> but, um, the thing is, Jesus doesn't even flinch. Yeah, yeah, we don't know the way. How are we going to get there? Uh, and Jesus just goes, keeps on. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And Thomas keeps going. Now, we come to John 20, in this resurrection passage, and we find Thomas again because. He's not hanging out with the disciples. Jesus is dead. Why gather with the disciples? What's the point? He's not with them. He's not hiding with them. He's not locked in with them. He's not hunkered down. He's just off on his own. Because it's over. And then they go and find him. And said, so, you can't believe it. We saw the Lord. We saw the scars in his hands. And we saw the side. And we, this, this is our experience. And his response is... Well, unless I see him, I'm not buying it. Now, you got to understand, that response is not a doubting response. That's the way he was all the way through. That was just him. He was the cynic. He was the one who just said the stuff. He was the one who expressed what people were too polite to express. And I think Jesus loved him for it. I think there's, a, there's something very powerful in, in Thomas that, that we could learn from because he didn't just accept what everybody said. He didn't just go along. He didn't just hear Jesus' words and, and la-di-da. Oh, he's a good teacher. You, no way. What are you talking about? And I think we need to have more of Thomas in us. Even though, you know, he's probably cranky to be around sometimes and he's negative as heck. <laughs> I'm not holding my ear now. <laughs> so, uh, is this so negative and he's gripey and he's just out there like me? You know, I, just, I look at that and I go, oh man, kindred spirit. <laughs> I used to think I was erratic like Peter, but no, I'm just cranky like Thomas. <laughs> and, and, and so it says the next week, this time he is with the disciples, 
And Jesus comes and says again, you know, peace, peace, don't be anxious, don't be worried, don't be afraid. And then, and then he goes straight to Thomas, right? Straight to him. Hey, Tommy boy, come on, check it out. Check out the hands, check out the side. Come see, this is what you want? It's no problem. I love that. I love that, that we don't have to protect God from our doubts, from our questions, from our fears, from our weird personalities. We don't have to protect God from that. Jesus actually, a risen Lord, can handle our stuff. That is a pretty strong message for Easter. Because we've all got things, but we feel like, well, we have to, no, especially at Easter time, you know, you better be nice. Uh, there'll be payoff at Christmas, you know, <laughs> the next time we're in church, you know. And uh, the thing is that um, you don't have to be nice around Jesus. You don't have to be, oh, sweetness and isn't everything great. You know, I had a, a, a great Easter experience. I told you I was crying out in the car and came in and ran into something. And we, we had to go get the bagels, bagel run, you know, at Safeway. And so um, you don't know the kind of work that goes into preparing for y'all. And uh, <laughs> not looking for sympathy. But anyway, so we go and we make the, ba the bagel run up at Safeway and get the, the fruit and stuff and uh, come into the line. And there's a checker there who's probably four inches taller than me. And she could hurt me in a street fight. And, uh, and she has a name tag. It's like Edith, I think. It was. Erica. Erica. Okay. Larry was there with me. Okay. So, Erica. So I'm trying to be the good pastor, you know? And so I get up there, and you know how you know you, you checked out the name tag, so you're all good. And so I'm acting like her best friend. Hey, Erica. How's it going today? Nothing. <laughs> she look at him, Jane. Jane Banana. Jane. Hey, Erica, isn't this a beautiful day? This is so great. Nothing. <laughs> the third time I use her name, she takes the name badge off and throws it down. <laughs> and keep orange. <laughs> strawberries. I go, wow. So you're just borrowing somebody else's uniform or apron here and had somebody else's name on it? Strawberries. <laughs> <laughs> All right, see ya. So anyway, I, and I thought, wow, she's a Thomas. She's a Thomas, you know? She's not going to take any stupid pastor coming in pretending to know her and act like I'm her best friend this morning calling her by name or not her name and who knows she's not doing that it's almost like she if she would have spoken she would have said get real buddy <laughs> which is a wonderful Easter message that's the point Easter is the one time if we're ever going to do it we can get real with God we can say, okay, Lord, here we are. What's your resurrection mean to me? What's the victory over death mean for those I love? How is life different now? We can miss it because like Mary, you know, we're all sad and gloomy and distraught and, and confused. Well, we can miss it because like Peter, we're feeling guilty and uh, we don't belong anymore and we just want to get out of there, go back to work. Uh, we could miss it uh, like the disciples who locked themselves away and hid out because uh, it's all over. And I would guess probably in a room like this that there'd probably some of us who would identify with any one of those, right? Or more. Or we could be like Thomas. Crabby old cranky Thomas who says, I want it real or I don't want it at all. That's what. Give it to me real. Lord, you want me to believe? Let me, let me, I got some issues. I need to have 
a personal relationship with you. That means you got to show up. Wouldn't that be a great prayer for us to pray this Easter? Lord, I invite you to show up in my life, in my work, in my relationships, in my family, in my issues, in my fear, in my guilt, whatever it is. I invite you to show up. Be present. Show me you're there. Show me you're real. Lloyd Ogilvie, who was the chaplain of the U.S. Senate for a while, said, what proof do we have that God knows, that he cares, that he's for us? Something very powerful is needed to counterdict and transform our negative attitudes towards ourselves. That's why God came in Jesus Christ. In time, but for all time, he came to reveal his essential nature, giving, forgiving, unchanging love, what he said about himself and what we're meant to be is ultimately reliable. Jesus was Emmanuel, God with us. I think that's all Thomas was asking for. If I'm going to believe Jesus is risen from the dead, he needs to be with me. It's not enough to hear it from some others who were so cowardly and afraid they hunkered down and locked the doors anyway. That's not going to make me believe. I don't think anybody um, believes in Christ because of church. You know, I know, I know. As a pastor, I don't. <laughs> yeah, heck, I don't even believe in church. You know, so uh, well. Wait, now you say that in front of guests, and you know, and then it's all confusing. Never mind. Strike that from the video. <laughs> but the thing is. What other people say doesn't really matter to us anyway, does it? We've got to know for ourselves. And so I want to give you a challenge this week. At some time during this week, and you can pick the time. It can be when you're on a good streak. It could be when you're on a bad streak. It could be when you just don't know what else to do. And you go, oh, John told us we had to do this. Okay. So either way. Uh, I want you to seriously ask Jesus, the risen Lord, to show up in your life and to show you that he's real and to show you that the resurrection matters today. Now, you don't have to call me and tell me anything, you know, because I'm not going to, you know, try and protect Jesus from you and your issues. I think Jesus can handle you and me. He can handle all of us, right? He's, he's, he's not afraid. I think he's waiting for us to be open enough to say, Lord, show up in me. And then he will. And he does. And he probably has already, but sometimes we miss it because we're not tuned in or looking. And then when he does, we can say, like Thomas, the crabby, not the doubting, the crabby, uh, we can say, my Lord and my God. Not their God and their Lord, my God, my Lord. And we can follow him now. What happened to Thomas? I didn't really realize this until a few years ago. I went and visited in India for a few weeks, and um, I was up in the north in an area of uh, very Hindu and Muslim, and uh, and I met some Christians there, and they said, "Oh, you're you're a pastor. You're in the wrong part of India. If you go down to the southern half, that's where all the Christians are." I went, "What are you talking about? India is India, because I'm ignorant, you know. I don't know anything." <laughs> and uh, India's it, and, and they go, "Oh no." <coughs> Thomas, Jesus' disciple, came here after the resurrection and shared the gospel, and the entire uh, 
history of Christians in India go back to him. Really? So he actually did change. Probably didn't change his personality, but still probably sarcastic and, and uh, a little you know, cynical and all those things, but I think it worked there in his ministry. <laughs> well, obviously it did. It had staying power, because why? Because it was real. Right. All right, pray with me. Lord Jesus, we long for you to come to us just like you did in the scriptures, just like you did to those first disciples. We have all the same issues, maybe, maybe more, and we need you to show up and be our Lord. <laughs> so we thank you for the resurrection. We thank you for your life. We thank you for your presence in our life. We thank you for the victory over death. And give us the courage to meet you face to face. That's our prayer. That's our need today. In Jesus' name.